Welcome, everybody. Um, this is a panel discussion on how content sort of curates culture, focusing specifically on high-end drama and India's booming OTT market. I mean, just to put it in perspective, a report came out yesterday that suggests by 2024, they're going to be between 55 and 65 million paying subscribers to OTT platforms. And that's probably from zero 10 years ago. So it's a rapidly evolving market, not just in terms of size, but in terms of content as well. So we're going to discuss that and we hope to have a very open conversation. The panel, we've had lots of great chats. I'm Nicola Bamford. I am the CEO of International Operations at Endemol Shine Group. And fabulously for me, I look after India, where I spent three years running the content side of um, India's second largest DTH platform. So I'm now going to turn to the panel. And if you could introduce yourselves, give a little bit of background, and perhaps talk of a couple of shows you've been involved in, and then we'll take it from there. Sure. Uh, I'm Aparna Purohit. I head India Originals for Amazon Prime Video. Um, I was amongst the very first people to join the Amazon Prime Video team in India to create uh, Originals for India. Um, cinematic TV, uh, uh, long format, limited series is new to India. While we produce a large number of films and very, very uh, large volume of uh, television content, but the space that lies in between television and cinema was untapped, very, very fertile space. And the idea was to really uh, create content and tap into that space. Um, I've been associated with almost all India originals. Uh, some of the originals that we've created are uh, Inside Edge, which became the first Indian original to be nominated for international Emmys. I'm very proud of that. Uh, Made in Heaven, Mirzapur, Comic Stan, Former Shots, Please. And we have a whole lot of shows launching this year. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mansi Darbar. I had acquisitions and operations for Applause Entertainment. Um, to give you a little bit of background about Applause Entertainment, um, Applause Entertainment is a content and IP creation studio based in Bombay, India. It's a venture by the Aditya Birla Group, which is uh, one of India's biggest multinational conglomerates. Um, what we've done with Applause is we have carved out and invented a new business model as India typically has the culture of you know, having broadcasters and production companies. With Applause, what we do is actually we work uh, you know, as a complement to the platforms in order to you know, work, invest, and create content, and then ensure that it reaches our platforms as finished tapes. Uh, because we strongly feel, though platforms also you know, commission content directly, we feel that there is a need gap and in the coming times, you know, in the market, you will need a volume of content and we hope to fill in that need gap. And um, at the same time, ensure that all our platform partners actually get value for money in value for money and, uh, you know, that complete the subscriber rate and the completion rate. And yeah, here we are. So actually, in the words of our CEO, our chief, Mr. Samir Nair, I would like to say and summarize that applause is like Apple. It's designed in California and it's produced anywhere. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ken Snoxley, I'm the CEO of Knockout Productions. Um, we look after physical production in developing markets. When countries are looking at traveling abroad, we help service their need in those new markets. Weirdly, we're probably one of the few companies that has delivered Indian production in the UK and UK production in India. Uh, we've done things like Next of Kin for Mammoth ITV Group in, in India. And here we've done uh, things like Rustam, uh, which is a big Indian Bolly a Bollywood movie, and uh, Bang Bang, which is a remake of uh, another show. Uh, it'll come to me in a second. Um, that was uh, came to number ten in the US box office. So we've done big blockbusters. We've done UK drama uh, as it travels. So we work in a number of different countries. And I think we're able to give quite a good comparison about working in India versus some of the other developing markets. Um, that's our hope. Brilliant. Well, thank you all. Just. Um, to the audience is um, the Edinburgh Festival app, which apparently works brilliantly. So if you've got questions and you want to use that to fire questions, we'll take them at the end. We'll definitely have some time to do that. So I think the starting point is to sort of set the scene. You know, how does the OTT market work in India? You know, are there regional language differences? Because I think that's increasingly important. And then sort of finally, how does linear, tradi more traditional linear TV sit alongside the OTT platforms? Sort of a free question. What do you think, Aparna? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, um, India, I mean, I, you know, I want to start by saying that this is an incredible time for content creators, for audiences in India. It's truly the renaissance of Indian entertainment. Um, there is, a, a, we are an entertainment crazy nation and uh, the need gap for really edgy, compelling, uh, disruptive content is massive. Um, so uh, just to give you, uh, you know, some sort of uh, landscape of India, um, we, uh, you know, we have 9,000 screens for about 2,000 uh, films that are produced in a year. So there is a massive uh, amount of uh, need for these films to reach audiences. Uh, you know, the biggest blockbuster in India is enjoyed by, say, about 2 to 3% of the population. And uh, so this low density uh, theatres, uh, you know, gives, uh, provides a need for the films to reach the audiences very early. Uh, India has traditionally been a linear market and which is support, which is ad supported. And uh, so it's always been the center of plate programming, um, you know, really servicing the lowest common denominator. And therefore the people on the fringes uh, wanting more compelling, more international kind of content uh, have felt alienated. So right now, it's the best time because we can really address uh, that audience gap, that need that exists, and uh, and create uh, content which can be enjoyed by everyone. Um, linear exists, it grows, uh, and uh, uh, you know, premium SWAT services like ours, uh, they grow. And um, I don't think it would be a stretch of imagination to say that in the next few years we'd have. Uh, an equal number of uh, television screens and mobile in our yeah. country. No, I think that's... Yeah. All the predictions show that for sure. And you, you see it every day, the number of people with smartphones in their hands compared to, say, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's just a fantastic opportunity for content creators on a one-to-one -one basis. What do you think, Mansi? Hi. Yeah, actually, you know, um, Nicola, the current setup of OTT in India is about, um, you know, it actually plays out like this. We've got about seven to eight OTT platforms currently in the market. And um, they're a mix of, of course, Indian and international players, right? You've got Netflix, you've got Amazon, then you've got domestic Indian players like, you know, Old Balaji, and you've got Eros now and multiple of those. Um, in terms of linear broadcast, um, uh, we've got primarily four main GECs, general entertainment channels, which have been Sony, Z, Star, and Wirecom, which is colors for us. And um, actually, you know, to come to think of this, we've got a really interesting link between, you know, digital and linear. Uh, so to say that all the four primary GEC channels um, branched out into, you know, having their own digital platforms. So Star has, of course, you know, got Hotstar, and uh, Z has got Z5. Sony has got Sony Live and, you know, Colors has got Woot. So there's a really interesting, you know, linkage and connection um, out there in terms of what is, the, what is the linear market like and what is the digital market like. Um, in terms of the languages we produce, uh, the content, and of course, there's Hindi. And along with Hindi, the other lo local Indian languages that we have, it's Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, Bengali, Marathi, Gujarati, and so on. So I think interesting times, uh, you know, both the digital and linear markets are, uh, um, you know, also colliding and, you know, merging and coming together and branching out into doing new things in new territories. Uh, but, but both are still growing, which I think is a really important yeah. sort of facet. Yeah. As we think about content and what people want to watch and what gets commissioned, th there doesn't seem at this point in time to be any slowdown in linear viewing or appetite for linear. And at the same time, the OTT platforms are, are growing rapidly. Absolutely. So, Kenton. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a bit of a perfect storm, really. I mean, you've got... Uh, existing demand for content and entertainment. You've got a um, grow, growing burgeoning GDP, growing middle class. You've got roll, roll out of digital going on all at the same time. And then you've got also a maybe a liberalization of content as well. So there's, the, the demand is, is kind of perfect. That's why you're seeing growth both in linear and in OTT, because there are so many drivers towards that growth. I think OTT is better positioned in a way to continue that growth because through digital rollout, as we've seen elsewhere in the world, it has continued to grow where linear hasn't, but the growth is happening in linear purely because the demand factors remain, they're, they're, they're solid. So, I mean, when, when we look at, you know, we, we've got this growing linear business, but the OTT platforms are coming along on top of that. 
it'd be interesting to discuss what sort of how content commissioning has sort of changed you know what what used to get commissioned for linear channels and how much more freedom do you have now with the OTT platforms in terms of the types of content and the stories that get commissioned mm -hmm. Um, I think finally, uh, you know, uh, it's the time for the writers in India. Uh, and this medium is really the writer's medium. Um, India is a land of storytellers. There are stories in every nook and corner. But uh, like I mentioned earlier, it was always being, pro uh, the content was programmed for the lowest, lowest common denominator. Uh, but finally now, you know, all kinds of stories, really fresh, independent voices, uh, you know, can be, uh, can be heard. So uh, for us, it's really how authentic the story is, how deeply entrenched it is in our soil, uh, how diverse it is, and how, um, uh, you know, it, it reflects the, uh, the changing uh, India. I, I, I'd just like to add that all of our stores, uh, shows are like little windows into the changing India. Um, actually, interesting times, you know, adding on to what she's saying, what Aparna's saying, really interesting times. And um, I like to put it like that, that um, again, I like to, you know, quote our chief, uh, you know, Mr. Nair, uh, where we said that um, India actually never got its HBO and Showtime moment, right? So we always were busy in producing telenovelas. And we never got to into that space of HBO and Showtime where we could actually produce content which would be realistic, which would be colloquial, where characters would be speaking to you. You would relate to them. You would resonate with them. You would listen to them. You know, the kind of content that consumes you, you get addicted to. So with OTT making a splashing entry, uh, you know, India in the last few years, um, it's been a really interesting change of wave in terms of, you know, the content consumption viewing and the content making. Um, as to what kind of content we are watching. Um, so yeah, interesting times. I think finally we, you know, a lot of youngsters, youth, um, get to see, uh, you know, who they are in their real spaces and the characters that they have all around them. You're seeing the same characters in those shows. So fantastic, exciting. Uh, you know, I'd just like to uh, share an anecdote uh, with everyone. Uh, about three and a half years ago when I joined Amazon and I was reaching out to all these fantastic filmmakers in India and asking them to create content for us, you know, they'd look at me and they'd say that, um, you know, you may have, uh, uh, you know, uh, started creating television, but, you know, we still have a few films left in us and uh, <laughs> please let us make our films, uh, Aparna. And, uh, you know, it took a lot of convincing. And... You know, uh, and we fast forward to three years later, every filmmaker now wants to create stories uh, for our uh, service. Uh, and it's because of the, because how liberating uh, this platform is, how liberating this uh, medium is. And you can really tell stories in its most authentic uh, way. It's, li it's truly liberating. And, uh, you know, one filmmaker recently told me that it liberates you from the weekend mafia that exists, you know, the box <laughs> office that exists, because your stories can live, people can gradually discover it and be immersed in it. Mm. Yeah, and no, I think you're completely right. I think you've got to think about the experience of viewing that content as well. In, in India, if you're going to the cinema, people are going to know you around you, they're going to be very aware of what you're viewing. It's going to be a less immediate uh, piece of storytelling. It takes a lot of effort, like it does in every other market, to go out to the cinema, go through that experience. But viewing it one-to-one, -one, Nobody's kind of watching what you're viewing. Everybody's aware of what you're doing. You can have much more of a personal relationship and there's much more, more space to tell those stories. Uh, I'll probably get told off for telling the story, but because um, I told it earlier. But, um, Later. Yeah. Um, so uh, 10 years ago, we were producing a show called Bang Bang, which is night and day. I don't remember it now. Um, uh, yeah, about 10 years ago. And it was all kind of set piece dance numbers, blowing up big trucks, that kind of thing. There wasn't, I think it actually got critically slammed for the fact that the storytelling mm. wasn't as well as it didn't go progress as well as it should have done. You know, 10 years on, there are shows that are films that are doing so well where you've got a chap making love to a fridge. You know, the, the, the fact that you've kind of got <laughs> that progression of storytelling is, is down to thanks to a lot of the work that the OTT platforms have have done, but also the liberalisation of the market as well. And that gives a lot of opportunity, particularly to the UK market, that's very good at telling immediate, personal, real stories. Um, 
helping and partnering with people in India to, to, to bring those markets and bring those stories to that market is a very interesting opportunity for us here. Well, yes, I think, you know, the, the India is the land of storytelling for sure, but there, there are so many, you know, international stories. So when, when people come and talk to you bringing international ideas versus local ideas, you know, how do you weigh up taking an international idea, is it how much adaptation is required? How do you deal with sort of local sensitivities and to make sure that story is, as you say, authentic? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'd, I'd like to actually congratulate you, Nicola. <laughs> yeah, uh, you <laughs> Not know, me because, personally, just because, by the way. Because uh, the way you've uh, taken Big Brother to India and the way it's being created in different Indian languages is... Is, is amazing, it's really incredible. Uh, while the uh, original format remains, it really becomes, uh, uh, you know, it's steeped into the local culture. And, uh, you know, while there are hygiene issues of having worldwide rights uh, in perpetuity, I mean, you know, if you're working with a global player, those are really absolute essentials. But more than that, how flexible uh, the creators are to uh, adapt the story to Indian culture, make it authentic. Uh, give it really the uh, uh, the Indian color, mm. um, have the same milieu, the culture, the values reflected. And, and a shameless plug here, but we're currently making it in three different languages, and I visited all three sets. And even without seeing the languages, you can absolutely see just by what the set looks like, how people are talking to each other, the degree of respect, the, mm -hmm. the volume of talking over each other, et cetera, et cetera, is, is quite extraordinary. Anyway, enough. Back to Mansi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually, to answer that, you know, how do you balance the local versus international stories and... Um, as a plus, we're doing a lot of adaptations. So we're doing a blend of adaptations and, you know, original series. Um, most importantly, first and foremost, I think all stories that are told are, of course, you know, to be set in the cultural context of your country and the milieu. Uh, and secondly, post that, I think what's important is the universal element in the story. So even if it's local or international, um, you just got to make sure that does this have the universal appeal? If it has the universal appeal, I think um, any caste, creed, country, um, you know, doesn't matter because it's all about emotions and emotions are universal, right? I think in the end, we're only human. Uh, so we just have different audiences in different countries uh, sitting back and watching that piece of content and saying, oh, you know, I relate to that. That is so me. Um, so, the universe, uh, so the universal element is essential uh, because end of the day, Old stories, characters, arcs, everything I think just boils down to being emotions of different kinds. So I just want to add um, uh, to what Mansi was saying that I really very, very strongly believe that the more local the stories, the more global they are. <laughs> now, uh, you know, if you look at uh, a Jack Ryan or Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, international shows, but have worked beautifully in India. Um, and, uh, you know, similarly with some of our Indian shows like Breathe or Made in Heaven or, or Mirzapur, extremely local, you know, uh, truly, like I say, entrenched uh, in our culture, but uh, have become the most watched Indian shows across the world. So, yeah. Yeah, actually, to add to that, um, you know, when we did the adaptation of The Office, uh, the US version, <laughs> right? So we've done the adaptation of The Night of, Hostages. The Office, the US version, um, it was a big challenge. Because first, of course, there's always been a benchmark that's been set. Uh, but exactly coming back to, you know, what I said a while back, the universal appeal. So when you do the office in India and you set it against a backdrop, you know, set in a city, uh, what you're looking at is, okay, this is the office. This can be an office in any country, mm -hmm. any place. You know, you will still have the boss. You will still have colleagues. You'll still have characters with different traits, right? And when you look at the boss, <laughs> say, oh, oh, my God, this is the trait. He totally loves himself. Shit, I have one back in my office, right? <laughs> so it's so relatable. The characters that you build tend to be relatable. And, uh, you know, we also need to keep in mind that we cater to all the different geographical elements all across. Um, you know, so that's something and I just wanted to add to this. Yeah, I mean, and it, the office looks great. I mean, it's fantastic. Thank you. So, Kenton, when you're working with people, how do you balance out the sort of the international versus the local, getting, you know, really ensuring, you know, the productions are honing in on, you know, that universality of, you know, what makes us all human? Yeah, I think that 
it's really following on from the other point as well, is that you can't get away from the fact that India is a, a massive content creator. There's some excellent people already there, both from mm. a storytelling point of view and from <clears> a craft point of view as well. Um, and why that's important is that I think there shouldn't be a naivety from UK producers going there about the fact, well, we, we know how it's done, we've done it, and let's bring it in there. Mm. And find the right partners, tell the stories with them, because you're going to get a much more honest piece of storytelling and much more success. Um, and you're also going to understand really how to get the most out of the country. Um, I work a lot with UK producers looking to shoot India. And, and in all honesty, I've, I've seen other people, um, things like Kukama Hospital, etc., double India elsewhere. And I, I personally feel it never works. I think that there's often a, a fear of going into the Indian market, which is misplaced. There, there are definitely real differences working in India. But if you navigate those well, you can't shoot India anywhere other than India, in my opinion. It is a uniquely amazing country, not just from the experience of filmmaking, but how it looks on camera. The light that you get in India is only found in India. And I've doubled India in Malaysia. This India has been doubled hmm. successfully in, in Sri Lanka. But you never get it quite right as if you actually do it in India itself. It's, 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 it's too diverse, too, too rich. I mean, it's yeah. thousands and thousands of years old in culture. It, it's got a very <clears throat> unique environment, which means that it looks very, very different. You have to, if you're going to go there, go there because you want to get that across to your, if you're at home, because it's so important. You know, when we did Next of Kin, <coughs> we actually searched the globe to look for how best to double Pakistan because there was very big concerns about how we were going to deliver Pakistan. Um, thanks to the Indian government, they helped us navigate to tell that story about 50 kilometers away from the Pakistani border. Now, that could have been shot in South Africa. And so many times you see, you see Pakistan doubled in South Africa. That could have been shot within the Gulf. That's, that's what we were looking at for them, or within North Africa. I genuinely feel that on camera, that looks different and more honest than any other mm. representation of, uh, of Pakistan. Mm. And the same goes for India. You, you, you can't shoot Jaipur anywhere other than Jaipur. <laughs> you can't shoot Mumbai <laughs> anywhere other than there. So true. And to stop you from getting what you perceive as a negative experience, you have to go in there knowing that you want that and that you have to work in a different way in order to get what you're seeking. Mm -hmm. They're not forcing you to go there, you're choosing to go there for the opportunity and for the story you can tell. So it's your obligation <coughs> to adapt how you work in order to tell that story to the maximum because that's how you'll get the best experience out of it. People are very talented there, very, very passionate there. Storytelling has a long, long, long history and a lot of credibility. Filmmaking isn't seen, as I've experienced within the Gulf and within North Africa, as kind of a, why aren't you getting a job, proper job in banking or in the oil industry? <laughs> within, within India, it's a very respected craft and people make things happen. You don't always know how they happen, <laughs> but they always happen. Yeah. And for UK producers that are very used to very strict processes and systems, that can be quite scary but you are choosing to shoot there, so you need to learn how to navigate it. And with the right partners, you can do that. It's very deliverable. Mm. We've done it many times, and, and I love it. It's genuine, people ask me, and I'm not just saying this because we're on this panel, where do I love shooting the most? Thank you. It's India, because yeah. it looks so beautiful, and the people care more than anywhere else yeah. I've experienced. Mm. And, and things happen. I mean, they really when, when, there's when, what, method to that madness. There, there. is method yeah. to the madness. <laughs> so, when, so when people decide that we want to do this, and you say, oh my God, how is that going to happen? And so they leave it with me. <laughs> And as long as you, there's trust there, which is core to any market and mm. doing anything, it happens. Sometimes you have no idea how, <laughs> but it does happen. And just to add to him, um, India's like mini Europe. You know, every... No, maxi Europe. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You know, like every, every 50 kilometers, the landscape changes, the culture changes, the language changes, the way people dress, the way people speak, the way people react to their and navigate through their reality, uh, you know, that changes. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, you have to go and adapt yourself to that culture and really steep yourself in that culture. Yeah. But it also is, I mean, I think coming on to one of the things that's amazing, it's a very young country too. There's that's a it. huge youth population. Uh, my data tells me 65% of the population is under 35 or under. And I guess that must have an impact for you when you're choosing, when you're thinking about commissioning, how does that sort of skew of demographics affect what you commission? Sure. India is a young country. Uh, and it's, it's, it's great because, you know, it's the youth that gravitates towards digital technology, the first. So they really define the, the, the habits, uh, you know, in a sense. Uh, they're nonconformist. They want to uh, have their own voice. They have their own 
head on their shoulders. Uh, and I think, I think we recognize that early. So if you see our service, we have a huge uh, number of stand-up specials, comedy stand-up specials, which was absolutely new to India because we felt that the youth needed a voice and they needed to be heard. Uh, we've created shows like Made in Heaven, uh, uh, you know, for those who've not seen it in the room, it's, it's a story of two wedding planners and how they go about planning Indian weddings, but it sort of also walks us through their journey, which goes into these dark recesses of their mind. Uh, and it instantly uh, resonated with them. You know, a story about, uh, the, the, uh, we have a show called Former Shots Please, which is a story about four women liberated in, in a city like uh, Mumbai, you know, talking about their sexuality, their dreams, their aspirations, shouting out and saying vagina, you know, which was never heard of uh, uh, before. So, um, so I think it's great that, uh, uh, you know, it's the youth who are helping us define this uh, sort of new uh, culture. And uh, we recently wa uh, launched the second season of our show called Comic Stunts uh, Season 2. Uh, it's the search for finding the next best stand-up comedian in India. And it has made a career in comedy aspirational for Indians. Yeah. Which is fantastic. In fact, that's a great segue to watch our sizzle. Yes, yeah, so yes, why don't why don't we watch yeah. the Amazon yeah. sizzle tape? Because it's yeah. fantastic and it a sort of puts pictures All of to this words. in perspective, yes. There's a musical, thriller, spy thriller, psychological thriller, and a period uh, historical drama there. Brilliant. So, Mansi, I mean, how does that demographic sort of shape affect your sort of views on, on what you commission? Because, you know, you're committing, you know, significant amount of capital to, to the ideas that you pick. So, of course, um, you know, Nicola, the youth is elated and they're on cloud nine that finally they've got a companion um, in terms of digital viewing. <laughs> um, all along, I think they felt so alone in the space of telenovelas where they, you know, maybe were forced or, you know, asked to sit down in the room along with their mothers to watch a piece mm -hmm. of content, which was not them. Um, so finally, they've got a companion. Uh, you know, who doesn't come and appear in their life according to as per appointed viewing. You know, it's the personal viewing. At any time, at any point of time, wherever you want to watch the content, at your speed, at your leisure, at your time, and the type of content, you watch that. In terms of commissioning and in terms of, you know, working on the content, the piece of content, um, I think the youth, uh, you know, watches all types of content. Um, it should just resonate with them. That's very important. So I don't think there would be any demarcations or segregation, right? That, oh, this action's gonna work, or thriller's gonna work, or crime's gonna work. Um, what is realistic and what is hard hitting, which makes them get up and see, oh, this is so me works. Mm. Um, so actually, it's about, um, you know, the who you are type of content. Content uh, you are addicted to, you get high on, content that talks to you, that consumes to you. Uh, consumes you and that you come back for again and again wanting more and more is what defines um, you know the content which is for youth or for anyone else so yeah interesting very very interesting actually Canton comments for you? I mean, it doesn't overly affect us because we're, we're mainly in physical production I think the only trend that I'd say that does impact us is the desire of more and more Indian productions to want to travel um, it's definitely helping the UK film industry. Uh, there is a lot of content shot here. Um, Tamil market never used to really travel for their feature films. They're normally lower in budget than, than, than the Hindi market. Um, and, and there isn't really much Tamil content that doesn't have a or higher end Tamil content that doesn't have a song that's shot abroad or something. Uh, and that does help our industry as well. So it goes both ways. There is a lot of Bollywood production that's actually shot within in the UK as well. And that's definitely been a demand for us. We've produced uh, shows across, um, sorry, films across uh, in Malaysia, in um, the Middle East, and, and in the UK as well for the Indian market. So it, it works both ways. You know, there's there's big opportunities to enter the Indian market, and there's also big opportunities to service the, the Indian market looking to go abroad as well. That's probably the biggest impact that's had to us in all honesty. So I think you know, coming back to the the, the theme of the the panel is. You know, with the increasing ubiquity of OTT platforms in India, you know, are you how are you seeing that sort of reflected back into sort of wider culture and the sort of public debate? I mean, are, do you think that you know people are having conversations 
about topics which potentially five or 10 years ago, they might have felt, oh, I'm not going to talk to my mother about that or my colleagues at work. I mean, are you seeing, you know, TV sort of reflects culture and culture reflects TV. Are you seeing a change in the debate? I mean, it's hard for me to tell as a sort of an outsider. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. Um, just to share a small anecdote that was shared with me by Zoya Akhtar, who's the creator of Made in Heaven. So uh, this show, uh, which I was talking about earlier, about two wedding planners, one of them is, uh, uh, is, is a gay guy. Uh, and, uh, you know, the show, uh, the show was received very, very well. Uh, and, it, and Arjun Mathur, who played the role of this uh, wedding planner, the gay wedding planner, has really become like the icon of uh, the LGBTQ community in India. In fact, he's just receiving an award for that. Uh, and after the show got launched, uh, Zoya was in Goa uh, holidaying, and there's a there's a guy, a little street urchin, who came to her with a with a small note, uh, which was given to this kid by someone. And when she opened it, and she shared it with me, God, I have goosebumps. Uh, you know, it said that thank you for making that show. I never had the courage to talk about myself, but thanks to your show, I can now talk about it. So uh, it's really shaping the new narrative uh, in India. It's it's. It's uh, igniting debate. It's, uh, you know, we're finally talking about topics that were taboo. Uh, women are finally getting an agency, uh, which is rare. Um, you know, and I, I feel uh, there's content for everyone now. You know, so my 74-year-old father has something to watch and my three-and-a-half-year-old niece has something to watch. So wide spectrum. Everyone's got, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of themselves on screen now. So I think there's a, you know, there's a huge debate for sure when you talk about, you know, the young and the old, as the young and the old are actually, um, you know, two sides of the same coin. And there's definitely, um, you know, there's definitely a relation and there is also a difference. So there's similarity and there is dissimilarity. For example, um, you know, there's a piece of content, there's a series that we've created and it's titled Rasbhari. Um, you know, which is also, it was actually shortlisted and it featured in Series Mania Festival in the short format competition. And it's about, um, so it's a sexual, it's a comedy erotica. And it's about a woman named Rasbhari. So, you know, the show actually harbors on and talks about the exploration and the freedom to a woman's sexuality, uh, which is extremely enlightening. And this is interesting to watch because it's progressive content. These are topics, like she said, you know, Parna, we haven't spoken about. And now finally, we can talk about them, we can, you know, discuss them, we can show them, we can, um, you know, go out there and say, yes, you know, this is something that exists everywhere. But with the, you know, the older audience, I would still say that, you know, at times there are still reservations. So any piece of content on digital, uh, which delves too deep into, you know, being sexual, abusive, or dark um, still makes them a little uncomfortable, right? So I think that uh, whole culture of, uh, you know, me watching something with my mother in a room, um, you know, it's kind of, you're just trying to break the ice, what you haven't done for so many years, <laughs> saying, yeah, mom, let's watch this. This happens, you know. <laughs> we, uh, maybe get an idea. <laughs> so uh, I think, yeah, we're just getting into that whole culture of breaking ice between the old and the young with digital, which yeah. is, again, a great um, insight, you know, at a human interaction and relationship level. Well, I think that's a good point to see your yeah. show wheel from applause. To, <laughs> to, to, to see. So if we could show the second tape, that would be great. This girl is either very strong or very dangerous. If you love your family, then when you operate on the CM Honda, it will not be alive. I am Jagdeep Chanda, and I am Jagdeep Chanda. Everyone says that I am the best boss. Rish? Yeah, yeah. Sunny and Roshni are also divorced. If you don't have a divorce, Kefali, Rishabh, welcome to therapy. And this one? Aiden, a review shot. 7.5. Cute, bad, though. Why are you so sad? Why do you feel like Sonia Ji is waiting for Rahul? Rahul is waiting for you. Who is going to die? Who is going to die?
नवाबी ना घटे सर वक्त आ गया है कि हम उन्हें उन्हीं के जुबान में बात करें लेकिन इस जवाब का वक्त और तरीका हम चुन लेंगे नवाबों को नवाबी भुला दिए हैं हम रस भरी कहते हैं महाराष्ट्र का भला तब होगा जब दिल्ली में बैठे नेता महाराष्ट्र पर ध्यान देंगे इतने दिन कैमरा के सामने छुपी रहेगी तू मुंबई में नया राजा आया है संभल के Before we sort of move on, Mansi, applause is quite an unusual business model in sort of the the TV world, and it's great. How how would you say picking content, funding it before it's commissioned for a platform? What are the sort of incremental freedoms or challenges that presents for you? Um, so you know, like I mentioned at the top, actually, that uh, with applause, uh, we've carved out a new business model for India, and we've delved into a new space and territory, uh, which is uh, that we commission, um, you know, the series uh, by ourselves. So actually, uh, we actually work to invest and create content, uh, which later, of course, you know, reaches our platform partners as finished tapes. There are a lot of challenges because um, the most uh, important and the biggest challenge is. Uh, that you're going ahead and funding and creating a piece of content uh, which is not commissioned. So once it's a finished tape, you're not sure whether it's going to be licensed or it's not going to be licensed to a platform. But you've made a you know really heavy risk, and you know you've taken the risk and you've put in heavy investment. So there are two R's. You know, like I said, uh, you know, there's uh, without there's no reward without risk. You know, which goes hand in hand um, as far as we are concerned as the model. So that's, I think, one really big challenge. Um, the second challenge is uh, anything to do with, you know, adaptations. So, like I said, that we do a mix of adaptation and originals. Uh, when you do adaptations, uh, there are a certain set of rights, and uh, you know, those rights are almost they're a list of uh, prerequisite requirements that any platform would want. And so, you got to make sure that when you're structuring those deals on the top uh, with uh, no platform being involved, you got to. Get all of those points in order. So at a later stage, you know, there is no issue um, in terms of you know rights. But uh, yeah, really exciting. I would say it's very challenging. Um, it's not easy because you're also selecting the content. Uh, you know, choosing the piece of content by yourself. That we should work on this genre. We should pick up you know this concept. It should be this character. You're working on the finer nuances. Uh, you know, every of every little creative element that you see in the series and put it together, um, without knowing whether it's going to be licensed or no. Mm. So yeah, but like I rightly said, that you know, um, the two R's that we stand by, right, and believe in that. Of course, you know, uh, without any risk, there's no reward. So though it's challenging, I think it's really interesting and intriguing and pushes you forward to do more and more things. Canton, next of kin. You know, you produce how? How, <laughs> <laughs> no, how? how did you get you get involved? And on a sort of a wider topic, you know, yeah. what do you think the opportunities, sort of partnerships or otherwise, do you see um, for UK-based companies in, in in India? Yeah, uh, next kin is weirdly a bit of a story of knockout, actually, and we'll, I'll show you some stuff in a second about what we've done, but. As part of our growth, uh, I was a producer in the UK. I used to run a small studio in the UK. And went out to Abu Dhabi, set up a film industry there, uh, looked at funding models there, and we started working with uh, Indian movies being shot in Abu Dhabi. Got to know a lot of people through that market. Um, I was speaking to John at James at Mammoth, who are good friends, and they were saying, look, we really want to double Pakistan. Do you know... So actually, they wanted to shoot in Pakistan originally. Um, I think we were having some issues with ensuring Pakistan. There was obviously some sensibility. Um, actually, Punjabi led, so you know, well-known Indian actress working there. Challenges associated with that, um, and they 
set as a problem, and that's really how knockout works. People normally come to us with problems <laughs> <laughs> um, for good or bad. I'm pleased they do, um, I suppose. <laughs> it's a good business model. It is a good business model. Um, <laughs> and they set us the challenge of how is it best to double Pakistan, and we looked at a huge number of options. We looked at South Africa, we looked at doing it in Oman, we looked at uh, the UAE, we looked at... Morocco. We did look at Pakistan itself and how we could manage those risks the, the most appropriately. Um, but ultimately, you know, I don't want to go into the politics of it, but there are some geographic, uh, very identical situations because you've literally got a line that's drawn between two countries. And so you have a very similar population, very similar styles, very sim similar ethnicity, very similar geography and architecture um, either side of that border. Uh, so the most logical way to do it was to shoot it in India. Now, that wasn't without its challenges, obviously political ones, and from the licensing and regulation point of view, how to do that. But where we were lucky is because I'd serviced a lot of Indian content, I had seen how producers were working and who to trust and who to partner with in order to produce that production. I think that's very critical for India, is don't go into India alone. The, the, the reason being... It's a bit like saying, could you imagine an Indian production turning up and wanting to shoot in London and not working with a British location manager or a British producer? <laughs> it's not that one is good and one is bad. It's just there's totally different systems and structures and ways of working. Yeah. And Brits that think that they can go out there and impose the way that, that we choose to work in this country on another market and you're going, to you're going to change the third most successful content creator in the world, they're very naive. And what, what I loved about John and James is there was very, uh, and Mammoth as a whole, is there was a real willingness to embrace that and go along that journey. And, you know, it's even right down to the minutiae. I remember having a very lovely uh, wardrobe lady from um, the UK who came over. And she was in bits on the first day because the washing machines broke down. We were in the middle of Punjab. There was a massive issue. We didn't have the normal, you know, massive uh, wardrobe trailer. And she says, uh, you know, in floods of tears, I'm having to wash clothes in the bath. I'm like, well, yeah, we will today, but we're going to find a solution tomorrow. <laughs> and there was a solution. And by the end of it, I'm, I, I see them. They, they stay in, she's staying in contact with the teams on the ground. She had an amazing experience. And she went through that journey with us. And I, I think that's a very small, very simple analogy of actually what most producers will go through. They'll feel that there's a massive uh, pushback. doesn't really fit to the way of working in. But if they embrace it and they go on that path, it is a, a unique magical is an overused word, but a magical place to make film. It really is. I, I do it a lot and it's, it's great fun. Um, I, I, we'll show you Knockouts Reel. Just, we do this in a lot of places around the world. This is how it works. This is, uh, we've produced a lot of high level content across the Arab region, into Bulgaria um, and into Southeast Asia. And there's a lot of India in this one. I think there's quite a lot of next of kin. If, yeah. if we could run Knockout Reel, that'd be great. So I think um, we'll go to questions, and we have some questions from the floor, and I have a few supplemental questions as well. But let, let's go, because I think that this, this is something which I think a lot of people who haven't spent time working in India, you know, there's so many languages. You know, how do you, you know, take that into consideration when you're adapting scripted shows? I mean, you know, is there a pattern that it goes to Hindi and then to other languages, or do you go to Telugu or Tamil and then go back to Hindi? How do you think about languages when you are looking at adaptations coming in from the UK or otherwise? Um, so, uh, I mean, again, it completely depends on the content that's coming in, um, because like I mentioned earlier, that, you know, every 100 kilometers, uh, everything about India changes. <laughs> Um, so how, uh, and the specificities, uh, you know, of the audiences uh, also changes. So uh, currently we have uh, content in six Indian languages. We have Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, Bengali, Marathi, and Kannada. Um, and uh, it truly depends on, you know, what, truly depends on, uh, you know, what the content is and uh, if it will have the resonance and how, can be um, uh, adapted for that local culture. So really no strict guidelines around that. Mm -hmm. Very, very flexible and open. Nancy? So we actually uh, primarily make content in Hindi. Um, and then it goes on to being dubbed in, you know, the other local Indian languages, uh, which is, uh, you know, like Aparna said, the language is mainly, um, you know, our Tamil, Telugu, 
Malayalam, Bengali, Marathi, sometimes it's Kannada and Gujarati, uh, depending on, you know, what the platform requirement is, as far as we are concerned as a studio. Um, but there are also exceptions where you hear a specific concept or you hear an idea and you feel, okay, uh, maybe, you know, we don't make this in Hindi, uh, you know, the mainstream Hindi language and we make it in the other language, Indian language. Uh, but 90% uh, of the times, primarily, uh, we produce in Hindi mm -hmm. and then it goes on to getting dubbed in the other Indian languages. And then they, of course, they have a widespread reach and it reaches every little land of uh, India. So I just wanted to add that we also have a big ambition in, uh, you know, different Indian languages. So while so far we've uh, created content primarily in Hindi, but now we have many, many shows that are in development in Tamil, Telugu and other Indian languages. So if we sort of, I mean, this seems to be a sort of theme and it's a question from the floor, but it's a, a bigger theme. You know, if people from, you know, the UK come to pitch you, I mean, is it, what, what are you looking for? Do you think that, you know, when, when international writers or production companies or producers come with ideas, what are you looking for that they bring in additional t to any ideas that would be coming, say, out of India, out of Mumbai or wherever? Sorry, there's two mics. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so again, you know, we don't look at stories, uh, um, you know, in terms of where they're coming from. Uh, what is the story? Who are the characters? Uh, how Indian it is. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say Indian, I don't necessarily mean that it's set in India. You know, it could be set anywhere. But how will it resonate to the Indian audiences? Mm -hmm. um, I think at the end of the day, it's just what's the story? Who's the storyteller? How passionate they are? And how uh, beautifully it can be uh, adapted to the Indian milieu? Just that. Yeah, to add to that, actually, um, you know, I strongly believe that each story um, has a heart of its own. And uh, if you feel that that heart actually beats in the, you know, heart of all your audiences and viewers, then I think we should just, we go for it. We go all out and we say, okay, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna produce that piece of content. Um, so it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, uh, what the story is, where is it coming from and which country and who writer and, you know, which creator. Um, we just got to understand also, of course, uh, the local milieu and the laws of the land, um, along with a great story that, you're, you know, that is being waiting uh, to be told to the global audiences. So on the sort of laws of the land issue, and we're not, we're not going to touch on all the regulation, but just specifically when you're on set, you know, what are the sort of rules, regulations that you're abiding by? I mean, you know, how regulated do you feel when you're telling stories, leaving aside health and safety and crew stuff, which is very strong in India? You know, do you need somebody on set? Are people signing off on scripts? Or are you feeling free to produce the shows that you believe are going to resonate for your audience? I mean, these are two questions, I feel. Um, we are absolutely compliant with the laws of the land. Uh, and in terms of the scripts, uh, we have a very robust process of development. So, uh, you know, if an idea is pitched to us, uh, we typically take it into development, and this development period can last anywhere between six to nine months to a year. Uh, and every, and it's a very collaborative, very feedback-driven process, and every script is, uh, uh, you know, signed off uh, by us. Uh, and then we are very, very involved in the process of casting, uh, and uh, uh, crewing of the show. Uh, we are also then involved uh, in, during the edit, so. So Kenton, I mean, you, you know, you, 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 you touched on some of the issues around, you know, the laws of the land, which are, the, you know, they're the same in India as are in any other country. Like, how, how did you find that process sort of coming from the outside? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to note that any Anywhere that isn't already a developed market and therefore arguably the stories are pretty saturated, you are going to face some challenges in terms of regulation. There's a reason that it's not a developed market, you know, from a Western filmmaking point of perspective, not from a, from a domestic market point of view. And you are going to have to understand what those sensitivities are and how to best navigate them. And the best way to do that is with a partner. You know, I'm bound to say that because we're a prospective partner, but whether it's us or whether it's Amazon, or, you know, however that works, you do need to find someone to help you navigate that. Um, I don't, I definitely don't find it, 
overly onerous. There are much tougher places to make content. We, we've got a shoot going on today in uh, Saudi Arabia. That's a challenge. <laughs> Total other end of the spectrum. Um, we've got somewhere like Dubai, which people would think of as relatively liberal. It's in the middle spectrum. India is far easier than producing in, in, in Dubai. Um, there are set processes to follow. They take time. I think that my real key, and it is the point that I will keep banging on about, is that it's very important that you go in with the knowledge and that you self-screen to a degree. You know, you know what will be sensitive. You should be working with people or you should be developing that knowledge by investing a lot of time in the territory to work out what will and won't work there. You need to brief your, your crews very heavily because there are things that are culturally appropriate and not, as we would do with an Indian team coming and working within London. Um, You've just got to know your market really well and, and know how to navigate that market. But that's, that is the same in every territory. Yeah. And, and the, what frustrates me a little when I'm meeting UK producers is that often a response is, oh, India is so ter terrible or difficult to navigate. It isn't. It's just very different to navigating. You know, of course, it's not maybe had such a, a linear uh, partnership with, 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 with UK content creation as somewhere like the States has. Because it's had its own success, so you're going to have to work out how you're going to to, to become part of that. And I, I, what I would say is, I mean, the content on the screen, the, the content you're seeing from these guys is is world class production value. Mm -hmm. No one looks at that production value if you take away the language barrier and thinks that that content couldn't have been made in the UK or the US. Therefore, and I also know that it's probably done at a significantly more cost effective way than maybe the content is made in the UK and the US. So what can we learn from it? Mm -hmm. you know, if you can create pictures like that, that are so beautiful and tell such exciting and interesting dynamic stories, how do we learn from that and try and tell those kind of stories in that way in the UK and US market? That's how I personally feel you should Especially it, anyway. in speed of production. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's phenomenal. I mean, you know, in addition to that, I'd just like to add that we are a very relationship driven industry. Yeah. You know, uh, and I think we uh, respond better to, uh, you know, face-to-face -face interaction uh, rather than emails. Uh, so I think that is one thing to keep in mind. Yeah, I know you're right. Um, uh, and interestingly, in the UK, how you may negotiate something is far less... Uh, driven by the personal impact. And what I love about India is that uh, some of the decision making is actually about, the, for, well, very much about the relationship you have with the person, the personal and, and, and emotional impact to it. And that can create some really good storytelling because storytelling is ultimately about emotions. And if you've got creatives that feel that they're supported and they have a bound in relationship with, 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 with the commissioner, that's, that's gonna create some really interesting stories. But you've gotta put the legwork in because you're choosing to work in the market, you know, not the other way around. So I guess that comes to the final, and it's a very pertinent question from, from, the, from the floor, is like, for people who are not based in India, but have stories that they would like to pitch to you, how, is it you have to get on a plane and come? I mean, how does the pitch process work if you're not based in, in India, but people feel there's a story that could really resonate in India? How do you like people to pitch to you? Um, I. I think times are changing. I mean, we constantly work with our counterparts who are in different parts of the world. Uh, so uh, just send us a mail, uh, you know, with your pitch. Uh, and the pitch needs to be as succinct, uh, you know, as possible. Uh, something that completely encapsulates, you know, what the story is, the characters, the treatment, the tonality, the texture. And if it has, uh, for instance, the multiple season potential, if it has the legs to go into multiple seasons, and if it resonates with us, um, then we get on a call or a video call and yeah, and we take it on from there. Yeah. So a uh, physical meeting helps, but it can be a, a second step. Mansi? Um, as far as applause is concerned, actually uh, what we do, if there's anything interesting and if people would like to pitch to us, uh, once they shoot an email out to us, we've got a pitch document and a pitch format in place, uh, which basically typically covers about, you know, the elements of mini Bible which uh, you know, starts from the concept note to the episodic beat sheet and different elements. So we share that with the people, with talent uh, working across with us from different parts of the country. And they send that across to us. Once, of course, the commissioning teams you know, kind of go through it in the content engine teams, they review it, we come back to them uh, in about you know, six to eight weeks. And from there on, if it's all fantastic and it's a win-win situation, um, you know, the we kind of green light the series writing, um, you know, moving on further down to commissioning and starting the process of green lighting production. So it's pretty straightforward and simple. 
Super. Well, um, I'd really like to thank our panellists, particularly Aparna and Mansi, who've come all the way from Mumbai to lovely Edinburgh to, to be here. I think it's been a privilege to host the panel and I'd thank like you. to thank you very much. I'd like to thank the audience on the last day. But, and finally, I'd like to thank Pascal from ITV, yeah. who has done the most fantastic job prepping us, preparing us for what, for me, has been a fascinating conversation. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you. Incredible.